why do people not know they have it? Because the liver is so incredibly resilient. I mean, talk about an organ that takes a beating and just keeps coming back. Um, there's a point where it will not come back. But for a very long time, a lot of us are asymptomatic. You know, I call it silent epidemic. I mean, think about it like, you know, like you said, one in four people have fatty liver disease. You step outside your house, one in four people you're gonna run into today have fatty liver disease. Really, really common problem. And it's silent because as, as Kristen said, you know, fatty liver disease doesn't give you really symptoms until it's too late. So you made me research the fatty liver, something I didn't know a whole lot about. I didn't know that not only could my belly get fat, but my liver could too. So now I have to look a little deeper at my body and understand it just a little bit more. But one in four people potentially have this fatty liver and don't know it. Talk to us a little bit about that statistic and, and why people should be aware of this right now. Yeah, so I think um, the reason that the statistic is so high is it because because it comes on the heels of the statistics looking at type 2 diabetes, looking at insulin resistance. We have a huge population that is struggling with higher than normal waist circumference. So I don't think we equate that to, oh my gosh, I have insulin resistance or my hemoglobin A1C is a little high. There must be something wrong with my liver. In fact, the liver is the last thing we think about, Right. Um, so that's kind of number one. It's so prevalent because we have such a high prevalence of metabolic syndrome within this country and really within worldwide. Um, why do people not know they have it? Because the liver is so incredibly resilient. I mean, talk about an organ that takes a beating and just keeps coming back. Um, there's a point where it will not come back. But for a very long time, a lot of us are asymptomatic. Or we might have some symptoms that are just in line with daily life. I'm tired. I'm just feel like I'm just wiped out, right? Who doesn't feel that way? So we might not equate it to our liver. In fact, I, I will let Dr. Hannanay say something, but I, I think most of us outside of his practice, most of my patients never think about their liver. So it's time to start thinking about it. And this is one of the reasons why we really wanted to get this message out. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, you know, I call it silent epidemic. I mean, think about it like, you know, like you said, one in four people have fatty liver disease. Uh, you step outside your house, one in four people you're going to run into today have fatty liver disease. Really, really common problem. And then, and it's silent because as, as Kristen said, you know, fatty liver disease doesn't give you really symptoms until it's too late, uh, unfortunately, and until you have advanced liver disease, cirrhosis, God forbid, and you don't want to wait that low, you know, you want to find the disease early on and reverse it, uh, you know, before you get in trouble. So it's truly, it's a, a, a it's unfortunate situation we're dealing with. Uh, it's a silent epidemic. You know, it's really interesting because it's something that uh, I, you know, I, I hadn't thought much about. You hear about the liver as something that you know is so important to the functioning of the body, but if you're if you're not a heavy drinker. So many people probably think this is never going to impact them or affect them. In fact, I, I heard on a, a recent podcast I listened to that you guys did that they've actually changed the name of the disease from the non-alcoholic um, version to actually something metabolic. And, and so you, you could give me the exact, the listeners, the exact name. But the interesting thing is, is that I think people think that if they're doing all the right things, avoiding alcohol you know, they, they really aren't aware of what things impact the liver. What are some of those things that people should be aware of? And give everybody the technical changes in terms, because I think it's interesting to understand this. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can relate to this uh, a, a bit in my experience with my patients. You know, there is a stigma of liver disease. As soon as you say you have liver disease, the first thing comes to your mind is like, goodness, I, alcohol? You mean alcohol? I've never, I've never had like, you know, I've never been heavy drinker. What do you mean I have liver disease? I see it with my patients all the time. Um, uh, so, yes, you're absolutely correct. This is disease has nothing to do with alcohol. It is it has all to do with metabolic syndrome, if you will, with metabolic dysfunction. And that's why they changed the name uh, from non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is a disease that is, has nothing to do with alcohol, into a, a, a new name. Uh, it's called metabolic associated fatty liver disease, meaning, you know, it's a disease, it's a condition uh, that is associated with metabolic syndrome. And what's metabolic syndrome? 
And metabolic syndrome is type 2 diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and the central fat around the belly, uh, sleep apnea, those kind of things that give you uh, technically fatty liver and put you at increased risk of uh, uh, heart condition, heart attack and stroke, those kind of things. And um, so, yeah, I'm really glad they changed the name uh, just to eliminate that stigma. This has nothing to do with alcohol. This has had all to do with metabolic syndrome. Uh, and and despite that, I think we still we still talk about alcohol in the book because it's still an important component, especially if you're in the latter part of the disease. Uh, you know, alcohol is not benign, and we don't want people to think that it is. It still takes a a pretty big beating to the liver, but uh, not really associated with an increase in fat, as we see with some of these other conditions. Well, I love biohacking my own body, and and um, just some background. When I was in my early 20s, I was diagnosed with colitis. And found out that this was something my family had had for generations. My grand, my grandmother had it. My grandfather had it. My grandmother had it. On the other side, like it was this consistent thing I had no idea about, right? And it really put me on a track to start to understand my own body and inflammatory markers, inflammation, you know. And and what what happened through that is I'm extremely high frequency tuned in to things on my body and how this comes to the liver is I gave up alcohol for let last year and I called my doctor and I have a concierge doctor and I said, listen, I want to do my blood work. We always do it in July, but I haven't had a drink in like 50 days and I don't drink a lot, but I do like a glass of wine with dinner or a bourbon occasionally and uh, or every weekend. And so I called and she goes, that's fine, Scott, we'll do it. I said, I just want to understand the impact, if any major impact is seen that short a, short of time. She goes, I don't think you're going to notice a difference but I'm in tune with it and I was aware of it. And and so um, I've started to pay attention to the liver. And then right across the street from me is one of my neighbors who's actually had uh, issues with fatty liver and this issue. And he's not a heavy drinker. And I was blown away at how much he's been struggling and what we were talking about. I actually texted him on on the drive up today and said, hey, I'm getting ready to interview these two amazing people. I had no idea about their mission or their message. Um, send me questions, send me things that you want to know about. And, uh, and I will get you a copy of the book. And he goes, well, if you don't get to talk about me, that's okay. I was like, no, this is awesome because I didn't know this was an issue. I've paid attention to the liver personally. I'm trying to biohack my own body, but then hearing about this and seeing the research that you put into this, as well as the, the simplifications of rejuvenating the liver, some of the things that you're just striking to people to in their brains that they can do right now were just amazing. And so I always feel like it's good for you to understand a little bit of the background and some of the things that people are seeing and hearing out there because you're really doing some really great work and it's interesting and new to people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. And there are so many of those things, right? Just even looking at things like sleep and then the connection of sleep to insulin resistance and, you know, just goes so further beyond just food and activity. And I think sometimes when when you were talking about biohacking and I just got myself an aura ring and I'm like obsessed with it, tracking my sleep. and everything. I got my whoop on right now. It's I mean, like, is on. Just, just everything. I want everything attached to my body to start tracking everything. But I think for the most part, um, you know, we don't think about anything beyond, okay, I'm eating fruits and vegetables and that should be enough. Or my cholesterol is okay, but my blood sugar is not great, but I'm not going to worry about it because my other numbers are good. So I, I don't think we look at the collectiveness of, you know, really every aspect of health, including the environmental aspect, walking outside, where do you live? Are you more likely to be inhaling environmental toxins than other places, right? So I just think it's it's also about thinking broader um, and realizing so many things are touching our health in so many aspects. Yeah, you know, um, when you think about the liver, you talk a lot in this book about ways that you can um, understand some of the signs and some of the things that people should be aware of. And one of the things that I find striking and very simple is waist size. Can we talk a little bit about waist size and and maybe um, move us into the conversation of the four um, types? We talk about the four metabolic types. What I feel like that's a really, I called my wife. I was like, this is super interesting. Number one, we're both good. Our waist sizes are both below this <laughs> average. So we should be okay. But 
you know, it's just interesting to learn these things. So share with our listeners that, please. Sure. Yeah. So um, when we think about waist size, we're, we're really interested in waist versus BMI. Um, you know, I've spent over 21 years at Cleveland Clinic, and I think the first half of my career was all about let's look at the BMI and then make an assumption. Right. So now we know that BMI is not really the best indicator, but waist size is a great indicator because it indicates what kind of fat you have and where is it in terms of the closest to other organs. It's very different to see the waist size versus the fat that we're carrying on our, our butt or our thighs. That's very different because in the waist, it's metabolically active. There's a lot of cytokines. There's a lot of inflammation that's going on. And it also happens to be incredibly close to where our liver is. So if you're a woman, you want um, obviously your waist size to be 35 or, or below. A man you, want, man, you want 40 below. And so when we came up with what are the four metabolic profiles, we essentially tune them in terms of what is your waist? So is your waist lean or non-lean? And then in addition to that, um, what is your what do your metabolic numbers look like? It, exactly what Dr. Hananay said. Do, do you have numbers that indicate that you might be pre-diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? Um, so the preventer, which is our first metabolic type, is healthy and lean, which means that your numbers are great and your waist is also great. So maybe you have that family history or maybe there's some genetics going on or maybe your diet is not that great, but it just hasn't caught up to you. Um, so that's our first one. The fine tuner is healthy and non-lean. So again, healthy, your numbers are looking good. Waist size not looking so hot. Recalibrator, recalibrator is unhealthy and lean. Um, so that means your numbers aren't good, but your waist size is normal. Like skinny and fat. That, it's like that skinny, skinny fat. fat we hear it's skinny time. fat. And the regenerator is you're unhealthy and you're unlean. So the purpose of us putting those together is that we are so unique. Um, we need to tap more into personalized nutrition. And we felt this was a great way to say, let's look at where you actually are, not just a random BMI, but where you actually are, and then make suggestions based on that for some principles that could help reduce your risk. Yeah, in our minds, actually, weight is just a number. You know, I mean, you know, we don't like people to focus so much on numbers and weight and BMI, but then instead that, uh, uh, you know, focus on the metabolic risk factors. And instead of focusing on BMI, like Kristen said, focus on the waist circumference. Uh, and that's technically the bad fat, if you will, that can go straight to your liver and give you fatty liver disease. Yeah. And so much of this has to do with sugar, right? I mean, we 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 go back and we look at at the sugar intake, the processed foods, the the things that people are eating. And, and Kristen, we talked about fatherhood and motherhood briefly before we started this. And, and, um, and I, I heard on the previous podcast, I was listening to about you having a donut with your, with your kids and, you know, somebody saying, I used to like to listen to you, but now that you're eating a donut, right. why would I? And, and it's, I know it's really funny <laughs> to me because I feel like so often, um, it, when I need to change something, I go extreme but I have to make the I have to be aware that extreme isn't sustainable. And so extreme is to shock or change the system. And then I slowly go, maybe I'm a hundred percent I cut something out. Like maybe I don't eat donuts at all. But then eventually I'm 90-10 or I'm 95-5. I find that if I don't allow myself to have those moments, that it's um it's almost it's just challenging. It's more and more your your mother can't make you food on a Sunday. She's calling me going, what do I make you, Scott? I don't even know. Can I make you this? Can I make you that? And I'm like, mom, just make whatever you're making for dinner. Right. But, but what are some things that people can be aware of from a diet perspective, mainly to stay away from right out of the gate? Because I think a lot of people know these things, but let's reiterate it to them before we go into some of the things that they can do that are like superfoods or super opportunities for them to really help get, get themselves maximizing their health. Yeah. So I think number one is to really kind of take a step back and think about anything that's going to increase insulin and your glucose levels. Right. So when we talk about this concept of sugar, a lot of my patients, I, you know, in fact, I had a patient the other day that said, I haven't had sugar in 10 years. And I was like, 10 years. That's that's pretty amazing. How do you do it? I don't find it difficult at all. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I just use agave. 
in place of sugar. And I'm like, okay, but agave is sugar. So I think like for number one, we have to kind of get our head around what is sugar. And sugar to me is, yes, it's the candy bar, but it's also the piece of white bread. So anything that's going to increase your your blood sugar, uh, your insulin, anything that I say is not connected to fiber. So we talk in the book about how fiber creates really this competition for digestion. So when you have something with fiber, the body might sense that there's a carbohydrate, like a fruit would be a great example, but it also senses this presence of fiber, which then works on the microbiome, et cetera. So I think um, let's kind of look a little bit more high level and not just, hey, I'm going to give up licorice for Lent, but I'm going to give up things that have a direct huge impact on my insulin and my blood sugar. Um, and, I, and I know, again, not to, to speak to, to Dr. Hanane, but in all of our discussions over the course of years, when I talk to him and learn from him about his patients, most of them are having a very high glycemic low diet until they go to see him and start looking at some of these other tactics to lower their carb content. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the name fatty liver disease is somewhat misleading. It obviously implies that there is fat in the liver. But people think if I eat fat, I'm going to get fatty liver disease. That's what misleading. It turns out, actually, if you eat carbs and sugar, you will get fatty liver disease. So yeah, 100% agree with Kristen. The key, low-carb diet, low to moderate carbohydrate diet, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's technically the key. And and um, and in my experience, I, I tell my patients to... We try, I try with my patient to identify one item in their diet. It's like, well, let's identify just one item this week and see if we can eliminate one thing at a time. Um, uh, you know, how about soda? Do you drink soda? Do you eat too much pizza? Do you eat too much pasta? Um, you know, let's cut and eliminate one item at a time. And then and then the other things I like to stress, uh, stress on is that it's not about eliminating carbs altogether, but uh, decreasing carbs. Uh, you know, you you can still you enjoy ice cream and 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 bagels every now and then, but you know, of course, every everything in moderation. Uh, but the key, I guess, the take home message is that this is a disease that can be fixed with low carb diet. So you, um, Kristen, mentioned that she's got the aura ring. I've worn the aura ring. I've worn the whoop. Um, one of the most interesting things in accountability and awareness. I've been wearing this whoop since 2019. I've talked about it on my show a lot. I love I love the awareness, right? One of the most interesting things is sleep and how what you eat and or what you drink, especially before bed, impacts the health of your sleep, your deep, your REM, your ability to actually break that down. So when we talk about sugars, um, you know, you're 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 talking about things that I've literally watched. I mean, I can have just about anything, but if I eat a late meal, I might as well have stayed up all night. My sleep looks like I was in a fight. I was in a high stress zone. I'm punching up all night long. REM and deep is minimized. My heart rate variability drops dramatically. It's already pretty low. And so when I started looking at these things, I'm like, oh my gosh, if I'd have known this stuff when I was younger, what changes could I or would I have made to be in a better position? Yeah. And I think it's interesting what you're saying about the late night eating. Um, I was doing a, a coaching program this morning with a bunch of people and someone put in the chat, uh, what are your suggestions for a late night snack? And so I really pushed back and I said, well, let's push back on that. Why do we need a late night snack? Like if we really think about this concept of fuel and fueling our body for a purpose, the body does a great job of keeping you alive while you're asleep. It doesn't really need you to give it fuel before sleep in order to do its job. So really, again, high level, and it's much easier said than done. I get that. Um, but I think the concept of the late night snack is really, you know, outside of looking at someone with, you know, different forms of diabetes that have a dawn phenomenon, we're not really looking at someone who would need to eat late at night. So this kind of gets into a little bit of something we talked about in the book, which was different forms of fasting and a time-restricted eating approach. Um, you, you know, our suggestion is really to stop eating at least two hours before you're going to go to bed. And then really looking at, to your point, what are you eating? I mean, if you eat a ton of fats, that sits in your stomach like a brick, 
And the body is really hard to break that down. So it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff to, to get that down. So I think um, when our sleep is compromised on a regular basis, what we know is that it's very hard to tap into our hunger cues. We feel hunger much more frequently. And we miss the cue that leptin is trying to give us that we are full. So when you can't tap into those hunger cues and fullness cues, it's kind of like the wild, wild west. You don't have anything being secreted to say, hey, I need some fuel or, hey, let's put the brakes on. We're good for the next few hours. And sleep, we know, has a huge impact of that. So there's a lot of associations. We could talk about sleep all day long. Um, but I think for the most part, you know, really keeping your last meal a little bit lighter because you are going to get into that place where you want to have really an empty stomach when you lie down and go to sleep. Not starving. Because then it might be hard to fall asleep, but an empty stomach. You don't want your stomach, your 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 GI system to have to work so hard when really it's just trying to get you to go to sleep and keep you there. Yeah. On, on the note of that, uh, avoiding late night snap if possible, you know, uh, intermittent fasting comes to mind. Uh, you know, intermittent fasting is obviously a very hot topic, and 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 there is no doubt it's very useful for a lot of conditions, including fatty liver. But honestly, intermittent fasting, just avoid that, that late night snacks. So if you think about it, you know, your last meal going to be 7, 8 p.m., whatever. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you get breakfast in the morning. That's almost like 12 hours of fasting. So kill two birds, one stone. Avoid late night snacks and intermittent fasting at the same time. And uh, and that uh, has been proven in research to be very useful for fatty liver disease. Yeah, something I do on a regular basis. So if I if I do have a big meal or I find myself overeating in a day, I will absolutely fast sometimes 24 hours. But I I I don't eat breakfast a lot of days and uh and then go into my first meal between 12 and 1. And um it's it's hard sometimes when you're working out and you're and you're active and you're moving a lot, which you talk about in the book, movement being something that we have to do. But it it is it's amazing how how it heals you. Um, you know, I go to the gastro doctor and he's like, hey, you're, you're a miracle, Scott. Everything's good. Everything's fine. I'm like, I'm not a miracle. I can't even tell you what are the things that I'm doing that are exactly changing, but I'm just doing everything. I'm getting more sunlight. I'm moving more. I'm paying attention to sleep. I'm watching. So if I, if I look through the book and I look at all the cues of the things people can do, so many people know these things but doing them is really hard. And I think what you guys have, have really done well with your message on is you're telling people to start small, make it make, you know, you got to make changes, but talk to us and our listeners about if you do find yourself with your one in four, you've got the fatty liver. What are some of the things that you can do to, to start to rejuvenate and generate, regenerate that liver and, and walk us through those things? Because I feel like um, people want to get started when they're listening to this podcast. They're like, okay, okay, okay. Help me get to the things I need to do right now. Yeah. I mean, I can cover the dietary piece of this for sure. So I think um, the start small is really important. And Scott, you had said that when you make a decision to do something, you're like 100% all in, but maybe that's not sustainable. And that was constantly in our head when we wrote this book is that we're not going to recommend a keto approach because many of the patients that we've seen that Ibrahim has seen, that I've seen, they can do great on keto. And then four months later, they just can't sustain it. So we know that there's benefit to a moderate carb approach. Um, I think from a start small perspective, one thing I tell my patients a lot is just get seven colors in every single day, get seven colors in. And so when we think about that concept of getting color in, obviously the color is going to come from plants. It's not going to come from a sugary cereal or something. Um, but get colors from plants. So that means you're getting a variety of different plants. That means you're getting a variety of different fiber, vitamins, minerals. And that then leads to microbial diversity, which we know is really the sweet spot for making our microbiome actually work for us. So that's kind of the, the first tip is just, just eat more color, right? Um, the second thing in starting small is to eat until you're no longer hungry and not until you're full. And that's really hard to do. That's really, really hard to do. But portion control doesn't really work. And there's a lot of reasons for that. You're in a group of people where we're 30% more likely to eat, overeat just because we're in a group of people, even if we're healthy. 
Um, you're having a food that's hyper palatable and you just can't, can't stop eating it. You're stressed. Who doesn't get stressed? And you're not when you're stressed, you're not craving like the steamed broccoli, right? You're 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 craving the bourbon or you're craving the pizza with pepperoni, right? That's 100 percent. Um, so this concept of like kind of eating until you're no longer hungry, once you get to fullness, you've overfueled. So I think get more color in. Um, in terms of the carbs, I always say like, don't become over overly obsessive about having to be carb conscious. But just look at where are the carbohydrates coming from your diet. So just write everything down throughout the day. And if you notice, oh, you know what? I realize at one o'clock, I always have a handful of pretzels. That's the place where you can replace it with something else, right? That doesn't either have that carb content or has more fiber content. And then really kind of, if you are going to have a carb, have it with something else. So if you're going to have something like you really want the piece of white bread, then have that piece of white bread with some extra virgin olive oil. At least get the healthy fat in there, right? So little things like that um, to try and just get what we call more bang for your nutritional buck. I, I would say those are big dietary principles that we have in the book. Yeah, on the um, on the medical side, uh, quite honestly, there is no medicine to fix fatty liver. Really, there is no medicine licensed uh, by the FDA uh, to fix fatty liver. It's like a wise man once said, let the food be your medicine. Um, so the treatment of choice for fatty liver disease is exactly what you heard from Kristen. You know, I'm afraid I have not much to add. I would, um, I, I always tell my patients, make sure you follow up uh, with your primary care doctor uh, to make sure diabetes is fixed. Blood pressure is under control. Uh, cholesterol is under control. Sleep apnea has been treated. You know, because those things, as we mentioned earlier, they're associated with fatty fatty liver disease, so they got to be under control. I I remind them that coffee, black coffee, is very good for the liver. Research over and over has shown has shown that coffee detox your liver, believe it or not. Very useful for fatty liver disease. Um, um, you know, obviously, too too uh, uh, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So you can't drink too much coffee. You know, you'll you drive your stress and anxiety and sleep and blood pressure crazy. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell them one or two cups of black coffee a day if, if, if you like. It. Um, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the third point, um, you know, uh, about alcohol, we mentioned that earlier. You know, I mean, um, I'm not going to say alcohol is good for the liver, right? Um, and and you, if you have fatty liver disease from metabolic syndrome, you don't want to put oil on fire. Um, um, it really one size doesn't fit all. It depends on the degree of fatty liver disease. If it's really bad, you might want to avoid drinking altogether. If it's if your fatty liver disease isn't too bad, maybe cut back on alcohol. But you know, um, but certainly avoid um, you know heavy drink. Um, but the point is that this this is a disease treated with diet. Really, I mean, Kristen is the is the boss. I I tell them to call Kristen. You know, I mean, there is no medicine to fix this. Well, what I love about this is, um, you know, it's unique to not have a drug to fix something, first of all. Right. And I know that um, that this was something that was first really identified in the 1980s. And and so I believe, right, they first started calling it the fatty liver disease in the 1980s. And, and it's it, so it's relatively new. Right. Another thing, Kristen, that you said that I thought is super interesting is you were talking about uh, the foods and how we cope with stress. I saw a statistic just this morning on the visual capitalist that that had a, a diagram of the amount of time each country spends eating a day. Okay. And the U.S. was last with like under 30 minutes. And I'm I'm paraphrasing. You could fact check me. It's probably wrong, but it's somewhere super low under 30 minutes. And it's like these quick meals that we eat. It's boom, boom, boom. France was like two and a half hours a day. And um, it's funny. I love Europe. I love the pace. And one of the things I love most about it is how everything goes with food and how, you know, there's a there is a coping mechanism to food, but it's also that connection to people. It's the other things we see in life, as we talk about on the show all the time, how we show up is important, but who we show up for, who we're having our meals with are really impactful. And so um, these are some of the things as you were talking that I was thinking about. And the last thing I'll say is the the lack of pharmacological like um, 
impact, the lack of the pharmacy getting involved right now is actually drawing people, drawing you two together, which I love because if more doctors and, and nutritionists, dietitians, and people in the food community were working together, we probably have even more solutions. And the fact that you two are putting out great data that's both research backed and diet backed and everything is so exciting because they go hand in hand. Yeah. And that's, that really was kind of the, the, really what motivated us for the first book was that I was getting patients sent to me that were just telling me, Hey, my doctor said I'm overweight and I probably have fatty liver. And he said to see you. And then, you know, sat back and what, what's next? Right. So I think that was really, we, we didn't have a treatment when we wrote the first book and it was really our motivating factor. We continue to not have the treatment. Um, I, I will say to, to really, you know, give a plug here for Dr. Hannanay. I think there's very few doctors where you could walk in and they know the lifestyle perspective of how to look at this. Um, typically they'll send them to a dietitian or, you know, maybe even a supplement. So I just think that that's really, I, I appreciate you saying that Scott, because I, that's, that's such a huge point is that there is not a drug to fix this. And I love what you had said about the connection. I thought about the blue zones and people will be like, Oh, well, the blue zones, they drink alcohol, but the drinking of alcohol in places like Italy are very different from us, you know, slamming three beers while we're watching a football game. It's very different. It's all part of kind of the experience of the meal. And I, I think we lose that. Um, e even like thinking about my, my kids and their lunch. I mean, I'm constantly trying to fight for more time for them to eat. I know I'm not going to change the food that they have access to at the school. So that that fight is lost, but can we just get more time? More time, right? So I, that's such a great point. Such a great point. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, you know, on uh, uh, going back to the treatment of fatty liver disease, uh, and just to mention exercise also. Uh, you know, working out and, and exercise, which obviously is not, believe it or not, it's not as important as diet. Diet comes first. Um, but certainly, you know, exercise can help burn the fat in your liver. And and speaking of time, you know, we don't we we all busy. You don't have time to go to the gym probably every day and spend like you know hour or two. But there is a recent study suggesting that you don't uh, have to exercise forever. You don't uh, you don't need all you need is 15 minutes three times a week, 15 20 minutes three times a week. The studies encourage interval training if you if you can if you're physical and like you know status allow you to do interval training you jump in on treadmill or a standing bike and like you know go fast for like you know a minute or so and then slow down and go fast again and uh, uh, 10 15 minutes 20 minutes kind of things uh, uh, three times a week that's going to help burn the fat in your liver. Well, in the Cleveland Clinic where you're at, um, I had lunch last week. I mentioned earlier with Dr. Rosen. I forgot the name, but now I remember. And and uh, he just wrote the Great Age Reboot. He's the author of the the U books, and he was talking about all the things that correlated. And his mindset on longevity was so interesting. I was telling him about my cold plunging and my saunas and all my. I mean, I I I really do try just about anything because I I want to learn. I, I'm I'm naturally more inflammatory. So the way I'm built, unfortunately, is this this predisposition to this uh, uh, the body from the inside out is kind of saying, hey, slow down. But the mind is like, oh, you can keep going. You love this. And so I'm, I'm always in this battle of of working between the two worlds. And so I use all these other things to help. But it, it was just such a great conversation because he, too, talked about diet. And I think so many people hate going to the gym, but but they don't, they, they really hate changing their diet. Like the gym is, if you gave them a choice, like, okay, I go to the gym every day. In fact, you see them going to the gym every day and they're like, I work out every day. And you're like, it's not working. You need to get on the nutrition side, flip the script, 80, 20, whatever it is. But I feel like by, I've never been able to narrow down the one thing, I guess is the point I'm making. And it's, it's so many of the the things together that become lifestyle. They become, um, my assistant listened to one of our podcasts and she recently made a lifestyle change. And she's like, I didn't just change my diet. 
I walk every day. I'm exercising every day. I'm changing my diet. Now I have no interest in the other things I was doing. She's like, it's so crazy to me that it took the whole lifestyle. It wasn't just one thing. I had to flip the script on everything I was doing. And then I made small incremental changes that were drastic for my life. Yeah. Oh, well, let me just say, Dr. Royzen is amazing. He's my mentor. And, um, you know, he's so he's within my department of where I work at Cleveland Clinic. And he one thing I just think about him, and this is getting to your point, is that every meeting we have, every time I walk into his office, anytime I need him, he is always on his walking treadmill and he's only going two miles an hour, but he is on it all day long. He can still speak. He's not out of breath, but he is constantly moving, constantly moving. And I think you know, we don't all have that opportunity, but 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 to Dr. Hanane's point, I think doing something is better than doing nothing. So even just like getting a little bit of movement, I mean, it sounds so cliche, like, uh, yeah, of course, we can park further from the store, uh, you know, all of those things, but it really does work. It really does work. Um, it, you know, just these little things, or I mean, you were talking about Lent, Scott, and one year I gave up stairs for Lent. Or, or elevators. Elevators, okay. Elevators, right? So it was just like... I was like, the stairs are something a lot of people can probably uh, get behind. Yeah, there, 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 there. <laughs> no, elevators. So I gave up elevators for Lent. So it was like, it was really interesting experiment, especially when I was at places like like airports or a building that was larger, like, I'm doing this. I'm just going to do this, right? And it was just such an eye-opener of how much opportunity we have for small little jumps of activity throughout the day that we just don't take advantage of. Yeah. The number of steps are really interesting to me. You know, everybody thinks they're getting all these steps and my wife blows me out of the water like every day. It is so painful. Like she gets up and immediately starts moving and she's moving constantly. Goes for a run with a dog. She does this. And on the on a normal day, I have to I have to literally plan for it because there's a lot of sitting, talking, meetings, all kinds of stuff that don't actually include any movement. And so when you look at it and you really start to track, you're like, okay, I've got to change these things. But the accountability of knowing is like that first step. I think so many people just don't know when they wake up and Dr. Ibrahim, they they end up in an office like yours and they say, Hey, what, what's wrong with me? I didn't know I even had a problem. And now I have to fix it. And it's like a shock to them. And then they're, then they're scrambling. And it's so tough when we're scrambling. Yeah, very true. No, 100%. Yeah. And, and, and the key is like, you know, obviously to, um, you know, identify the problem early on. You don't want to wait too long. So the sooner you jump in on it, uh, you know, the better. One of the things that I think is really interesting, too, is we talk about kids and you were talking. I can't not talk about the fact that how ridiculous is it that there's limited recess, that there's oh. limited time to eat. Nothing drives me crazier than the garbage that we put our kids through and we teach them so that when they get out of school, they they're already in those habits. I mean, it's hard enough to carve out time to eat lunch in a business environment. I mean, I, I and hey. God forbid somebody is making your schedule for you. It's just popping stuff in all the time, right? So I, um, I mean, it, it, that is a such a great point to remind the kids the power of the time they take to both eat, what they consume. The second thing I wanted to bring up, and, and um, this is for either of you, but I find it very difficult. I'm from an Italian family. My mom loves me through food. And um, I just saw Jerry Seinfeld two weeks ago, a week and a half ago at the Hard Rock in Florida. And he's has a new movie coming out about the Pop-Tart and how the Pop-Tarts save breakfast. <laughs> and, um, and it's hilarious. But if you think about it, you know, we are kind of that, we're the first full generation of eating junk all the time. And our kids are often given a pass. I'm using air quotes for our listeners. They're given a pass. Like, it's okay. They're just kids now. But what we're really doing is we're teaching them the things they need to use when they get older. And I'm not saying don't have a donut, don't have ice cream, but I can't tell you how many times I'm like, put away the goldfish. Maybe we can eat this. Why don't you do this right. instead? Or and they think I'm just crazy and overbearing and pushy. Um, but 
what are some of the things that you guys advise parents to build the skills from the get-go so that the, the kids don't wake up and have to regenerate their liver? Right. Um, well, you know, some it, it does start with the parents because if you have parents, statistically speaking, and also looking at the data, you have parents that are um, obese, they have metabolic syndrome, they have fatty liver, children are more likely to have fatty liver as well. Unfortunately, Dr. Hannaday, who could speak to this, um, you know, has many scenarios like that within his practice. You know, I think um, the key is to let kids be kids, but to an extent. So part of that is also involving them in the process of cooking. Um, I, I think, you know, as a mom, I have some really busy days and sometimes I just want to get dinner on the table. And when my little ones come in, it's like, no, if you help me, it's going to take another half hour, right? We're just so busy. So I think I, what I try and do is I try and involve them in the, sho in the shopping experience, right? So I'll let you get something that's a little junky, but for everything junky, you have to get two things that's not junky. And you have to promise that we're going to try and figure out how to utilize this. So get them involved as opposed to just putting something in front of them. Um, and I talk to my kids a lot about this concept of hunger and fullness. Um, you know, not to go back to bashing the schools, but my eight-year-old, he came home every day with his snack that he would have. Uh, why aren't you eating your snack? I don't get it. And so finally he said, well, snack is at nine. I'm just not hungry, mom. So, and then just like a light bulb went up that like, they are told at 9 a.m. They get to school at 8 that they are to take their snack out, and that is their moment to take snack. And they, there's not another snack throughout the day. There's just lunch. So we are also kind of training to tell people, well, when there's a specific time, you eat. It's just no different from I'm in the workplace, and at noon, I eat. doesn't matter if I'm hungry or not. So I think we need to really go back into – Really taking a step back and saying, am I hungry or am I just thirsty or am I just stressed? The why behind our choices is just as important as the choices, because that's the only way to find that sustainable behavior change. Yeah, uh, you, you're hitting Scott on a really important point about, uh, you know, children and adolescents. Uh, remember the statistics we talked uh, earlier in the episode, one in four uh, adults uh, have fatty liver disease. Children, actually, and adolescents are not much different. Um, uh, you know, the fatty liver disease is on the rise, um, which is a huge problem for obvious reason, but specifically because this disease uh, is a slowly progressive disease. It takes approximately 20 years or so uh, to get to significant liver disease, like liver cirrhosis or, God forbid, liver cancer. So what happened, like, you know, five or 10 years ago, most of the uh, patients with fatty liver disease were in their 40 or 50. So when they get to 60, 70, you see bad liver disease. What's happening today is that young people getting fatty liver in their 20s, well, I mean, that's going to be a huge problem in the future because they're going to get in trouble when they are in the 40, 50, like the golden age. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a huge problem and, and, and it's need to be addressed. Yeah, it's it's funny. I can remember going to my grandmother's house and um, she made the greatest food, but I could literally leave a dinner or a lunch and have eaten myself so full. But when I walked in, if I didn't take something from her food wise, I was I wasn't walking out of there without eating something. Anyway, she'd be like, you at least want to put in pop. You want to put in pop, don't you? I mean, that was always she had those in the freezer because my grandfather liked them. And then, then there was always like the, I'll just make you a small sandwich, even if you take it to go, right? And what's really interesting is we talk about intermittent fasting and what fasting did for me is it took away my brain's mental block of having to eat the way that I grew up. Like if you were bored, you were eating. If you were sitting around with people, you were eating. I mean, we went out to a winery and we had just finished this huge lunch and my mom orders a charcuterie tray. And I'm like, mom, we just ate lunch. Like, she's like, someone could be hungry. And it's so funny. And now she's a servant leader. It's because she loves everybody. We're not offended. We all ate the damn thing. Let's be honest. <laughs> but at the same time, by fasting, I actually taught myself that it was okay to miss a meal. It was okay 
mentally, I flipped a switch and it's been, I can remember a couple of years ago where I had to fast for like giving blood in the morning. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so, I can't do this. It's going to be lunch by the time I, and today, you know, it's nothing for me to do a 24 hour fast and really feel great about it. And to not have ever thought about how starving I was. Um, do you, do you find that to be a, a, a starter for people? Like in, in, is that a way that people can get control back of the, I have to eat at this time? Yeah. And I think it's hard at the beginning because I think, uh, if we're used to eating one way where we've got a lot of calories coming in and by the way, there's so much data looking at calorie restriction and longevity, right? So a lot of calories coming in and then we ask them to slash that naturally through a time-restricted eating approach, let's say, or even doing a 24-hour fast. It's really challenging at the beginning, but it becomes easier. And what I'm seeing in my patients is over time, they can't imagine how much they used to be eating. I, I mean, oh my gosh, I was just eating so much. Um, I don't know if Dr. Royzen shared this with you, but one of the really interesting things he says in one of his books is really to just not eat when the sun is down. Yeah. It's a really interesting concept, right? Now, it gets a little screwy once you get into summer because you have so many hours, <laughs> right? But in the winter months, um, it's a great way to to look at this, right? And then even what you were saying, Scott, about you, you typically don't eat until 11 or 12. And so people will say, oh, well, you can't skip breakfast because there's so many studies that talk about how great breakfast is. But Really, it's like, again, we're associating this word breakfast. Your breakfast could be at noon. It is simply breaking the fast, and that's what breakfast is. So breakfast doesn't have to look like the Pop-Tart at 7 a.m. on your way out the door. Um, the point here is that we can make our diet look however we want. Even within the plans that we recommend within the book, we consistently say, take pieces and parts of these plans and make it what works. At the end of the day, if you don't like something in a plan, you won't stick with it. If I tell you to eat kale and you hate kale, you'll do it for me for a very short amount of time. And then eventually you won't do it anymore. So I think tap into your personal preferences, listen to your hunger, but really recognize that if you eat slow, if you take a lot of chews, if you put the fork down, if you put the TV off and you take that time, you have a much greater ability to eat a lot less. We're distracted all the time, and this is why we're constantly eating. Yeah, I I, um, I read a paper recently about intermittent fasting, and and something comes up that uh, that I uh, tend to use with my patients. Um, uh, you know, use intermittent fasting gradually, meaning you know this week let's stick with six hours a day, um, you know, relatively easy, and then the next week let's go up by one hour, seven hours a day, you know, etc. For for another week or two. Uh, do it gradually because to your point, Scott, yeah, I mean, it's not that uh, one size doesn't fit all and it's not always easy, but I think, you know, all of us can pretty much do six hours, in, you know, uh, for, for a week or two and build up from there. Yeah, the non-snacking. It's amazing how just cutting out snacks right. will change the whole relationship with food. People snack so much. And, um, and I know that they think that eating small meals is helping their metabolism. And in some ways it can be. But it, in other ways, they're building habits that are, again, unsustainable. You're always going to want food. So um, it is definitely challenging. I, I, uh, Dr. Roizen did a, did a presentation for the conference I was at, and then I had lunch with him, and we had a, a pretty long one-on-one -on -one conversation. And I was really, um, it, it was exciting to hear someone who's so curious. And I think that's what I'm getting from both of you, is that you're very curious at learning and growing and gathering more information and helping people change from where they are today, they can be in a better spot. And that's really the message that you're putting out there. That's what the book's about. It's about making the adjustments and changes. And, and that's really a special mentality. That's not that I think a lot of people, you know, doctors used to be the number one uh, most trusted profession in, in the world. And after COVID, that has decreased by a substantial amount because of the, the, the surplus of information and the surplus of challenges and the curiosity that seems to have gone away. You are definitely a breath of fresh air in, the, in both the medical and the diet world, and, and it's great to have the conversation. I have one last question. I know we're wrapping up. 
um, for my friend and and neighbor who has um, issues with this. It, let's say that this is your neighbor, and and um, what do they do? Where do they go if they need the best treatment in the world? If they need to to do something to you know, it's 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 a latter stage issue. We've talked about re regenerating for the for the youth. We've talked about making changes, but what about that person that that maybe is having some major issues and they're further along? What are some of the things that that you would tell them if you wanted to give them the best chance at at survival and beating something or or at least living longer? Uh, yeah, I'd say um, this is uh, well. Number one, uh, consult with healthcare provider, your primary care physician in this case, uh, and get your liver checked, which can be done with routine blood testing. That honestly can be done during any routine annual physical. Um, and see what's the liver look like. You know, uh, do you have abnormal liver tests? Are they normal? If they're abnormal, obviously, your primary care doctor are going to proceed with further testing. Find out what's the cause of your abnormal liver test, which is in this case, it sounds like going to be fatty liver disease. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, you will stage the severity of liver disease. Find out how bad is the liver by doing some kind of picture. Uh, you know, something called ultrasound or even fibro scan, which is like an ultrasound-like machine, tell you how much damage you have in your liver, et cetera. And then you go into the management, uh, which implies uh, sitting down with a dietitian and uh, and and a primary care doc and, uh, and, and or, or a liver doctor and, and talk more about how we're going to fix fatty liver, what kind of diet program we're going to build on. Um, but that goes into screening, find out if you have a problem, and uh, stage the severity of the problem, how bad it is, and then number three, management, which implies in this case mostly um, a dietary uh, recommendation. Yeah, I mean, I send all of my patients to to Dr. Hannanay because I think he's the best. Um, but from a dietary perspective, I think just simply starting out by eating less and having less food that isn't really food, right? So Michael Pollan said that food was something that comes from nature, is fed from nature, and will eventually rot. So a lot of times I will start with my patients right there and I'll say, hey, 90% of the time I want you to be eating food and I never want you to feel fullness. And sometimes you just need those first few weeks of doing something as simple as that, really opening your eyes to what's in my pantry, what's in my fridge, um, to get that motivation to say, you know what, I think now I'm going to become a lot more plant-based or now I'm really going to start looking at labels differently. So starting small and high level is always the much more sustainable approach. Um, but it could just start with, let's just, let's just eat more food, but let's have less of it. Let's not overeat, which again is one of the challenges that we have in this world, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know even when I fast, sometimes I sit down for dinner and I'm starving and, you know, I'm really putting in the extra calories, but I also pay attention to that whoop. It tells me approximately how many calories I burn for the day and approximately I'm paying attention to what I'm putting in. That's a simple thing that we could do just to identify are the numbers matching up or not. Um, what I will tell my friend and neighbor is uh, maybe to call uh, Dr. Roizen and, uh, and your team uh, do the full scans, all the stuff that that not everybody will do, what you're not saying, which I appreciate, but I do know there are more extensive things that 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 some doctors will do that 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 some people will do. And I think that it's beautiful that you guys are working together, that you're coming up with these solutions. Um, get the book, everybody. Uh, it's something that you probably don't know much about, but it's a niche that uh, we need to know more about and help ourselves. If one in four are today, imagine what that next generation is going to look like if this is a progressive disease that people aren't aware of today. So, um, Dr. Ibrahim, Kristen, I'm so grateful that you guys could join me. Thank you so much. And one last thing, how do they find you? How do they get your information? Tell our listeners. Uh, they can just go to my website, kristenkirkpatrick.com, Kristen spelled with an I, or um, on social media at Fuel Well with Chrissy. And I'm based in uh, the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. I work with a group called MNGI, uh, Minnesota Gastroenterology. So MNGI.com, you will find my information. 
Okay, so you're going, if you're going to go to Minneapolis to see Dr. Ibrahim, you have to go in the summertime. It's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> Get that vitamin D. It's a little cold right now. I hear it's underwhelmingly cold this year, Minneapolis. So um, you're you're not as bad as as uh, as normal. So uh, um, I wish you guys great success with the book. I'm so thankful for the time we had, and I look forward to watching your journey and following you on social media. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. you. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, there's more where this one came from. Click here and enjoy some more.